The podcast today is sponsored by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and free 30-day trial to their service, no cost or obligation, just by going to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. That's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K for Something You Should Know. Today on Something You Should Know, why is Siri, the voice on your GPS system, and virtually every other digital voice female instead of male? Also, do you hate to negotiate? Lots of us do, and it may just be the way we approach the process. We each react to the other side's worst fears. You know, I walk in thinking, you're going to be stubborn and adversarial. You walk in the same way, and we create that environment. But it doesn't have to be that way. Plus, why you really need to stop telling people how busy you are and having a purpose in life. It's important because of all the things it can do for you. For instance, a purpose in life will help you live longer, reduce their risk of heart disease and stroke, reduce their risk of depression, literally help repair their DNA, even have better sex and more friends. All this today on Something You Should Know. Something you should know. Fascinating intel. The world's top experts and practical advice you can use in your life today. The Something You Should Know podcast with Mike Carruthers. Hi, welcome to the podcast. So I have an iPhone and I I don't use uh, Siri on my iPhone very often, but I, I one day asked her a question and she started talking to me in an English accent. And I didn't, I, I'm not that into Surrey, so I didn't understand it and found out later that my son had switched it because you can make her talk with an English accent. But it got me to thinking, why is Surrey and, you know, the lady uh, in my car GPS system, why is it always a female voice? Now, if you ask Surrey what her gender is, she tells you that she doesn't have one. She's just a computer program. But certainly, Her voice is female, and virtually all other digital assistants, GPS, and other voice-guided programs, all female voices. Why? Well, apparently there are a lot of reasons. For one thing, studies have shown that people, especially women, prefer to hear a woman's voice. It may also be preference from birth. Babies will pay attention to a female voice more than a male voice. History may also play a role, since women were old-school telephone operators and pilots were given instructions by female voices in the cockpit to distinguish instructions from men operating the plane. And ever since the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, Hal, that male robot, he kind of made male robot voices just generally creepy. So this preference seems to change from country to country, though. Surrey has defaulted to a male voice in the UK and in France. And of course, you can always change Surrey to a male voice on your iPhone anytime you want to. And that is something you should know. The thought of negotiating turns a lot of people off. But really, we all have to do it. Some would say we negotiate every day, all day long. Certainly at work. In marriages, in relationships, with kids, we're constantly negotiating. So why does it have this negative feeling associated with it? And is there a way to approach negotiation in a more positive way? Well, of course there is, or I probably wouldn't have brought the subject up. And here to discuss it is one of the top experts in the world on negotiation, Dan Shapiro. Dan is the founder and director of the Harvard International Negotiation Program and associate professor in psychology at the Harvard Medical School, and he's author of the book, Negotiating the Non-Negotiable. So, Dan, what's your, first of all, your general take? What's your philosophy on negotiation? I am a negotiation imperialist. My definition is anytime you are interacting for some purpose, you are negotiating, which means you're doing it all the time. And most of us, I think, however, believe that we're not especially good at it, that there are some people who, you know, train for it, that guys like you are really good at it. But, you know, I'd rather I'd rather avoid the whole situation. It's, it has that that car salesman feel to it or it has that very high level, you know, uh, government negotiate. It just it just I'm out of my league is, I guess, what I feel like. 
most people have this anxiety toward negotiation. You know, it's something scary. We feel like we're going to have to give something up. We're going to have to concede. It's going to be a hard bargaining game. And the approach that we found tends to be much more effective is helping people work together. You know, how do you try and reach some sort of mutual gains where both people walk away better than the, than, you know, than the alternative? So, so, you know, I, I think, you know, we often, we think of, Negotiation is the classic sense of two business people sitting at the negotiation table. It's a sterile environment. They're staring each other down. They're being ultra stubborn, and everybody walks away shaking, having gotten nothing that they wanted. That approach doesn't really work that well. You know, so the approach that we tend to advocate is one where the parties, you know, literally or at least metaphorically sit side by side and try and work out their differences as a problem-solving effort rather than as a battle or a competition. Doesn't that, though, require that both people kind of put their guard down and stop looking at this as adversarial? And, and don't you need to have buy-in at, at, at the beginning with that mindset before you can do much with it? That's the fallacy. I think that's the dangerous assumption that in order to negotiate with the other side, we both have to desperately want to negotiate and you know, to be open to a friendly relationship. What tends to happen is we each react the other side's worst fears. You know, I walk in thinking you're going to be stubborn and adversarial. You walk in the same way and we create that environment, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, so uh, if, if a single side walks in and recognizes you have a lot of power to frame this conversation the way you want it to be framed and to be tough in framing it, relentless in framing it as a joint process, you know, the two of us working together, that's power. You know, that is absolutely uh, power. It's not soft either. You know, that, that it takes strength to be able to do that effectively, and you end up with more. It seems, though, that, that negotiation kind of by its nature has a lot of potential emotion and conflict in it, which, you know, are, are avenues to derail the whole situation. And that's what another thing people are afraid of is that that this whole thing will just blow up. Yeah. And it can. (laughs) I think it's true. Uh, I mean, so in my book, one of the key concepts that I talk about, I call it vertigo. And it is that experience that we all have. I think we all have it. When you're in the midst of a conflict and you start to get consumed by that conflict and by the relationship, you can't think of anything else other than the conflict. You have a fight with your spouse in the morning. You go to work, but you're not really at work. You're in your head. And you're still thinking about that conflict from the morning. Uh, Just as true at work, the same thing can happen. You get into a tough conflict with your boss, with a colleague, and all of a sudden you can't focus on anything but that conflict. You go home, there's your spouse, there are the kids, but you're not thinking about them. You're not there mentally, emotionally. You're still at work with that angry colleague. The first and most important thing to do is to recognize when you get into vertigo or when you're falling into that place of vertigo where you're starting to get consumed by the relationship because that's your moment of opportunity. You know, if my wife and I get into a conflict and and I can feel it starting to go into that spiraling downward cycle, you know, I, I can just allow it to happen and react or I can say in my head and possibly to my wife, wait a minute, you know, we're heading toward vertigo. Do we really want to go there right now? And you, you create a choice where there wasn't before. That's power. I like that. Of course, <clears throat> there's always that issue of in the moment. It's easy to talk about it now, but in the moment, it's hard to do. Oh, I, amen. <laughs> it is hard to do. And, and that's why I, I, you know, I think there's some who advocate for the quick fix. You know, here's the secret to effective negotiating. Here's the secret to having a happy marriage you know, all the time. I think the secret, it, it, there, there is no instant coffee when it comes to these really important relationships in our life. Uh, in, in, in the book, another concept I talk about connected to that is what Freud, Sigmund Freud, initially called the repetition compulsion. And this is the idea that we tend to repeat the same dysfunctional patterns of behavior again and again. You know, whether it's at work with, with the team, you know, the, the, the team gets together to do the next project. And we have the same problematic conflict with the same people yelling at each other, not talking, avoiding, and so on. That's the repetition compulsion. It happens at home. 
uh, you know, with, with the family, you get into the same conflict again and again and again and again, and you don't know how to get out. Uh, and, and one of the most useful ways to try and get out when you're stuck is not to try and deal with it in the moment, but preventively. You know, so when my wife and I are in a good place, you know, I walk home today after talking with you, and I say, you know what, let's sit down for a few minutes and think about our conflict patterns. You know, what typically happens? What parts work? What parts don't work? That's the moment of power. When, when we are in the conflict and, and my wife glares at me or I glare at her, that's the hardest moment to get out of that vertigo and that cycle of repetition that people tend to get in. So prevention is worth its value in gold. You know? And nobody ever thinks to do that. I guess because the, the subject is so difficult, like you're almost afraid if you talk about conflict, you'll start one. Oh, yeah, and, and that, that happens, <laughs> you know. It's true. So I, I think even talking about how you're going to talk about it, it starts to feel like a, a, a loop cycle, but I think that's true. Uh, I mean, the, the, but the point is that we're not talking about the conflict itself. We're talking about the pattern of conflict. I'm not talking about the fact that, you know, with my wife that I forgot to do the dishes or she did, whose fault is it? What we're really talking about is how are we going to have a conversation? You know, normally, Mia, my wife, normally when you and I have a conflict, uh, you know, I, the negotiator, try and collaborate, and you withdraw, and then I start to get defensive. You can start to see the pattern that typically happens. You know, why is she withdrawing? Because she needs a little space. Why am I collaborating? I want to get this thing over with as quickly as possible. Yeah, well, and it makes all the sense in the world. It's also good to hear that you have the same troubles that everybody else has, because you're such a, supposedly such a smarty pants, you're not supposed to have this problem, but it's nice to hear. No, 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 I'm very pleased to say that I'm a human being, yes. (laughs) But what happens, what happens, though, when you're uh, in a conflict, when you're in a negotiation, when you're trying to fix things, and it, it seems like, it's either out of control or the point is I'm, I'd ra- you know, I'm trying to be right rather than, you know, get this over with. And, and it just, yeah. it gets so emotional that it just, it's hard to get any, and, and make any sense of it anymore. And we've all been in those kind of conversations. Uh, what do you do then? Well, I, I think the first step is to recognize the, your mindset, the mindset you're in. I mean, your mindset is what controls your behavior and your feelings. And, there's a, a term that I've coined for the book. I call it the tribes effect. And the tribes effect is an adversarial mindset. It is that, that notion of me versus you, us versus them. And the moment you get into that mindset, your conflict, the path of conflict has been, you know, concretized. It's been paved. Um, and, and so I think the first step is really to become very aware of when you and your team at work, your family at home, when you're moving toward that mindset. When all of a sudden it's not, oh, we're a family, but no, it's me versus you. And sensitivity to that can allow you to preempt that mindset before it actually takes a hold on you, you know. It sounds <clears throat> like what you're, you know, getting at here, too, is that it's really not so much about how you do it as, as much as it is how you prepare to do it so that you do it well when you do it. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely right. A huge part of effective conflict resolution is preparation. It's thinking in advance, uh, who am I negotiating with? What, who's, you know, who's this conflict with? And how can we work most effectively together? Uh, down to even, you know, what might you say, what might you do to try and enlist the other person as a partner and not as an adversary? Uh, all this stuff might sound, you know, like a panacea, pie-in-the-sky thinking. It's not. You know, it takes strong effort to actually move things in a cooperative direction. But but you think that, in general, it's human nature to if you set the table correctly, that people will buy into this collaborative, can't we just get along kind of m- mindset and, and approach? No. Uh, I, I, I think it's necessary. I don't think it's easy. Uh, I mean, the, the patterns that we have in terms of how we deal with the conflict are very set. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult to move to a more communal or cooperative mindset if we're in the midst of this sort of 
tribal me versus you mindset. And, and that becomes the core of the problem. Because if, 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 like, if you and I are in the midst of an argument, you know, we're yelling back and forth, and we do this every day, you know, it's like over lunch, you and I as colleagues, we get into these conflicts every day. The most unnatural thing to do for both of us is to change our pattern. That feels unnatural. The conflict feels natural. That's the problem. Uh, and so it is useful to take a step back and to think through, well, what is our pattern? What's one small thing I could do to try to change my relationship with Mike, our working relationship? Uh, so that we don't end up in the same place that we've been in for the past two years as colleagues at work. What about those times, I guess, you know, maybe what you're talking about in the title, the non-negotiable, when people are, you know, stuck there, <clears throat> uh, it has to be my way or the highway, and you've got, you know, two people who are just going in circles, not getting anywhere. How do you resolve a non-resolvable conflict? I think the first thing to do is to recognize that most conflicts are resolvable. You can deal with them. I mean, the problem is not with the conflict objectively. The problem is with your mind and, and with your mindset in the conflict situation. That's where the transformation has to happen. You can, I mean, just as an example, you take a divorcing couple who really just despise one another. Every time they're near each other, it's like two cats, you know, clawing at one another. Uh, they build that, that, that pattern. And meanwhile, what's happening, you have the seven-year-old, you know, kids watching these fights, and it's good for nobody. Uh, so so I, I, I think, you know, the first step is to recognize it might feel non-negotiable, but most of the time there is a way to, to move toward at least some greater degree of reconciliation between people. Not all situations but more often than not. Uh, for that couple, one of the first questions I'd want to ask is, you know, what's your purpose? You know, what interest is this serving for the two of you to be clawing at each other day and night and, you know, ultimately to be causing to despair to each of yourselves? You're causing financial ruin for your family and your child is over here crying. So in other words, are you open to the possibility of trying to move your mindset away from me versus you, that other is the bad person, towards something that's more mutually compassionate. Uh, and that's a big, tough question. Uh, and, and I think if people jump into the skills of negotiation without dealing with the mindset, they are going to get nowhere. It will be non-negotiable. You know, if I walk in and I say to the, to the angry divorcing couple, hey, you know the answer to your problem? You just need to listen more and ask more open-ended questions. They're going to look at me like I'm crazy. That's not the problem. You know, the, the problem is in their mindset. Each thinks the other is evil. Uh, each thinks their own perspective is right. The other is wrong on all counts. It's a blanket division. So, so I, I think you need to start with sh a shift in the mindset. And from there, the skills can work much more effectively as well. Listening, asking open-ended questions and so on. If if you can make that your purpose, because, I mean, we all know couples see couples who there's so much contempt that they'd much rather, you know, they'd much rather be miserable and, and, and argue than than be happy and get it resolved. They, 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 there's some sort of joy or satisfaction in pissing off the other person. You, yes, you can get that short-term moment of happiness. I, mean, I don't know if you call, I don't know if you call it happiness, but... Um, satisfaction, uh, I think. Satisfa exactly, satisfaction. I, I'm not sure I'd call that happiness, though. You know, I think it is satisfaction, but it's not happiness. It's not harmony. It's not positive equilibrium. Uh, and it's not healthy. You know? I, that form of negative emotion can wear on health and well-being as well. Uh, I mean, if, if, if that couple of... If you ask an individual, would you rather have your divorcing, you know, that spouse you hate uh, suffer, or would you rather be in a happy relationship and enjoy life? Now, they might choose the former, but I'm not sure it's the wiser choice. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. But if it's the choice, you know, if you've got somebody you're ta trying to negotiate with who's just a jerk, I mean, a first-class jerk... Is there still a way to figure it out, or, or do you just walk away? 
Well, but you might want to walk away. Uh, but before doing, I mean, if, if it's a, let's say a marriage and there are children involved, I think that's an important question to think through. Do you just want to walk away? Um, is the marriage redeemable in some sort of way? Is the work team redeemable in some sort of way? It, it's very, once you get into this thing I call the tribes effect, this mindset of division, it's very easy to write off that other person as irrational. Uh, in my own work internationally, whether working with hostage negotiators, working on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict situation, uh, working with businesses, the moment people get in that mindset, what ends up happening is they ask the question, how do I negotiate with somebody who's irrational? You know, or, you know yeah, these are wonderful ideas, but this isn't going to work with this person. I don't think you know who I'm negotiating with. And the problem is twofold. One, the other side saying the same thing about that person who I'm talking with. And, and two, things aren't getting dealt with effectively. It, it's irration- I don't believe in irrationality most of the time. And I think at the end of the day, each side has some rationality for doing what they're doing, for feeling what they're feeling. You might not agree with it, but the first and most effective step toward reconciliation is trying to appreciate what is going on from that other side's perspective. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I want to understand it in order to influence them and to, to change the nature of the relationship. When you step back and look at all the, the data and all the everything you know about negotiation, are there some things that people have misconceptions about or don't understand or you wish they knew um, that, that really would help this process? Yeah, I, I, one of the concepts that has struck me more than anything else is the power of appreciation. <laughs> it, it sounds so soft, and, you know, I'm looking out the window now like, you know, like a floating cloud. Oh, it's appreciation. It is one of the most powerful tools in helping people deal with utterly contentious conflict situations. The ability for the hostage negotiator to understand and see value in the perspective of that hostage taker on the other side of the door, that's huge power. To, you know, the, the couple who's in the midst of constant conflict, they get sucked into their own mind, their own world. What's the power? The power is to try to understand and see the value in the other side's perspective. You know what? Maybe my husband, maybe my wife, they're not as irrational as I, as I thought they were. Boy, it might be a little hard to live with me, you know. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with why they're so upset, but now I understand that it creates a whole different environment, but, you know, uh, possibility at the end of the day. So I, I, I think that power of appreciation, you know, should not and cannot be underestimated in helping to reconcile even the most intractable feeling conflicts. Great. Well, that's, that's great news because I think so many people look at negotiating in a very negative light and you've really put it in a much more positive light. And, and I think that helps everybody. Thanks, Dan. Dan Shapiro is the founder and director of the Harvard International Negotiation Program, associate professor in psychology at Harvard Medical School and author of the book, Negotiating the Non-Negotiable. There is a link to the book on Amazon on the show notes page for this episode of the podcast, which is located at our website, somethingyoushouldknow.net. And Dan's book is also available as an audio book. And if you haven't taken advantage of Audible.com's free offer, you can get Dan's book for free. They're offering you a free audio book download and a free 30-day trial to their service at absolutely no cost to you. You just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. That's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K, and get your free audiobook download. It could be Dan's, or it could be any one of thousands and thousands of titles to choose from. Just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. That's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K for your free audiobook download and 30-day free trial. And once you start listening to audiobooks, uh, I bet you get hooked. It's really a great way to consume books. AudibleTrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. Do you have a purpose in life, or maybe more than one purpose in life? And if you don't have a purpose, how do you find one? Victor Strecker is a professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and he's author of the book Life on Purpose. 
And I think when you hear what he has to say about the importance of your life's purpose, you'll probably make it a real priority in your life. So, Victor, explain your journey of discovery here. How did you figure out that finding your purpose is so important? Well, I'm a behavioral scientist. I've helped people make big changes in their lives for over 35 years, helping people quit smoking, lose weight, manage stress. But I've always felt that there's something deeper and um, kind of a fundamental underlying condition that often causes these things. And what we found increasingly is that that might be purpose in life. If we can help people find purpose in life, we now know that we can help them live longer, reduce their risk of heart disease and stroke, reduce their risk of depression, uh, literally help repair their DNA, improve their antibody count when they're assaulted with stressful uh, uh, diseases, uh, even have better sex. So there are so many positive things as a result of having purpose in life. Uh, I thought maybe I should work on this since, uh, you know, this is maybe fundamental to so many other behavior changes. It's fundamental to being happy. Uh, that's what I do in my life. I try to help people uh, become well, and I think this is uh, the fundamental cause of wellness. Gee, is that all it does? <laughs> yeah, I know. And, oh, what are the side effects? Better, stre- uh, better sex and more friends. Better sex, more friends, and less disease, and a million other things. So it seems like there might be a good reason to find a purpose in life. If, this, if purpose in life were a pill, it would be a multi-billion dollar drug, it would, or it would be in our drinking water. So let's define what it means to have a purpose in life. Other than, you Thank know, you get up in the morning and, and uh, you know, brush your teeth and off you, off you go on your day. What, what does it mean to have a purpose? And, and do you only have one purpose? I want to demystify the concept of purpose. What we're really talking about are our core values set in motion, operationalized with goals. In other words, I really value at work teaching my students. I really value my students. So I set a goal around that, which is to teach every one of my students as if they're my own daughter. And so that becomes my purpose at work. I have a purpose at home. I very much value my relationship with my wife. And so I set a goal around that, to be an engaged husband. So that's a purpose. In other words, we can have multiple purposes. We have purposes at work. We have purposes at home. Uh, with our family. We may have personal purposes. We may have global or community purposes. Do you need more than one, or is one enough, or is more the better, or what? Well, I think we have different dimensions in our lives. So I think it's important to have purposes related to these different dimensions of our lives. Also, we go through life. So we uh, may find a job. We may decide to get married. We may decide to have children. We may retire. We may get sick. All those points in time, all those transitions in life may require that you reconsider your purpose and literally repurpose your life. Do you think most people have a purpose? We find that most people do have a purpose in their lives, but I want to make sure that I distinguish just having a purpose from living in alignment with your purpose every day. Aristotle basically said, it's not just about having purpose, and now I can go to Disney World. It's about being in alignment with your purpose every day. And that, at least for me, and I think for other people, requires a lot of energy. It requires wind in my sails if I'm a boat, and it requires willpower, like a rudder. But, you know, even if I have a lot of wind in my sails and I have a rudder, I still need a harbor. I still need a purpose, a direction for my boat. And do you find that a lot of people have found themselves in a place where they're doing something? Maybe they have a job that they're getting paid for, but it's not in alignment or part of their purpose. They kind of stumbled into it because for whatever reason their dad did it or it it was their first job they had or whatever and that that's taking them out of whack? You know, so many people, so many people at work find 
that they can't connect with the purpose of that work. And yet we have found, even looking at custodians at our medical center, that some custodians just work for the dollar, but other custodians feel like they're part of the medical team. They read books to the children who are sick in the hospital with cancer uh, because their parents never go to see them. Uh, maybe they're too busy, but they read a book every evening to that child. Or a person who's in a coma, they'll put a fresh flower in front of that person just in case if they ever wake up, the first thing they'll see is something of great beauty. That's a purpose, and those people are never absent. And they love their role. They love being at work. So I would say you can find purpose in nearly any job. Uh, it almost doesn't depend. It, it almost doesn't matter how dirty or grubby the job is. I think it's so important that we try to find purpose, that we craft a purpose in our lives and in our work. Every example that you have mentioned thus far has involved somebody else. You know, we're reading stories to children or leaving flowers for people or being dedicated to your wife or there's always somebody on the other end. Is that par part of the definition of a purpose? Well, again, Aristotle talked about this over 2,400 years ago. He said there are hedonic purposes related to hedonism where, you know, we're focused on pleasure for ourselves. And we all love to, to have pleasure. We totally understand that. But he said, if that's all we are, then we're like grazing animals. Uh, and we all like to graze, you know, on food or drink or sex or whatever those things are. We like to graze, of course. And he said, that's fine. It's just that we should also be in touch with something bigger than ourselves, something self-transcending, in other words. And it turns out that self-transcending core values and purpose seems to be much better for us physically. So that's why having self-transcending purpose, thinking about other people, other things, things about, you know, other than ourselves actually is better for ourselves. Those people with stronger self-transcending purpose end up doing better themselves. Interestingly enough, organizations who have revenue transcending purpose actually make more revenue. So there's something kind of interesting, almost Zen-like about this process. Well, yeah, <coughs> which which makes you wonder, well, let me ask you this, that people usually, as you say, have a purpose. Is their purpose something they kind of stumbled into, or typically is the purpose something that they sat down and said, okay, this is my purpose? Um, I think that people who are religious are very naturally drawn toward purposes because religion talks about core values, um, you know, sets up core values and helps you build a purpose from those core values. But increasingly, people who are not religious are saying, you know what, we have purposes too. And I completely agree with that. I think it's very important, whether you're religious or not, to think about what your core values are what do you care about the most, in other words? And by the way, you can walk home, you know, turn around, look around t to your family and say, maybe that's what I value the most. Or at work, look around. What are the things you value the most? What in your community do you value the most? Set a goal around that. That becomes your purpose. Try that purpose out like a suit. See if that suit fits. And if it does, wear that suit. Can you be too into your purpose where you're ignoring other things in life? <laughs> I think actually it's the opposite. I think what purpose does is help you throw out the Cardassian sisters from your life. In other words, all I'm saying here is throwing out the things that may not mean as much, really, in the bigger picture. We're only on this planet for a very brief period of time. So... Why do we spend so much time watching what other people are doing on reality television shows when we could be working toward our purpose at home, at work, in our community? Why do we care more about what Kim Kardashian is doing than what our neighbor, who's an elderly neighbor, is up to and doing? But, but those things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. You can still do both. You can do both. And sometimes following reality TV shows or some sporting event or whatever is relaxing. 
and that's fine. If that gives you more energy so that you can work toward your purpose, fine. But one of the things that purpose does, and this is very similar to Buddhism as well, it helps you focus. It helps you focus on what matters the most in your life. It's not that you can never dabble in these other things that matter less. That's not a, you know, believe me, look at my own life. I can look at my own life, and, and certainly I, I do all sorts of things that are not directly related to my purpose. On the other hand, having a purpose helps you focus, concentrate, persist, uh, be more resilient uh, in the face of difficult times. So I would say purpose helps you get rid of most of the extraneous junk that's in most of our lives nowadays. Have you ever talked to someone who clearly has a purpose, but when you dig a little deeper, it's the wrong purpose? It isn't really their purpose. It's just something they think is their purpose, but they'd be better off with another one? You know, one of the things I think about a lot is the authenticity of a person's purpose. And I think there are probably multiple purposes. We all have aspirational purposes, things, you know, that relate to what we want to become. But we also all have a shadow purpose, something that maybe we need to work on that we need to, first of all, acknowledge, yeah, that probably is something that I really am striving to do. I wouldn't tell anybody about that. I'm not that proud of that. And I actually need to work on maybe uh, exercising that less or getting rid of that. So, yes, I would say that uh, some purposes are not authentic. And we should be striving toward an authenticity. Again, I'll go back to Aristotle. He called this our true self, our inner diamond. He called it D-A-I-M-O-N. And he said, you diamonic well-being, being in touch with your true self or inner diamond, is related to being truly happy and truly well. Uh, but it does require being in touch with this authentic, true self inside of you. Have you ever come across people who clearly don't have a purpose or don't know what their purpose is or and, and maybe couldn't care less? I run across people every day who don't have purpose. Um, I, but very often I meet people who want to have a purpose in their lives. And by the way, these might be very wealthy people, very well-off people who have everything else in their lives, but they really lack this eudaimonic or true self-transcending purpose. So they've gotten all the money they need. They've had all the hedonistic purposes fulfilled in their lives, and they're still really hollow. They feel unhappy. And, you know, of course, this has been our zeitgeist for 30 years. We've talked about things like this. So the big question, though, is how do you get rid of that? How do you start focusing on something that's bigger than yourself and a real purpose? So that's, I do help people with that all the time. But, of course, there are many people who don't have purpose in their lives. That's part of what's called nihilism. And I would say, increasingly, our society is nihilistic, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this. So what are the first steps, what are the toe-in-the-water procedures to find your purpose and, and, and really feel connected to it? One of the first things to do is simply ask yourself, what do I care about the most? What do I value the most? Um, do I value my family, my spouse, my kids, my friends, my community? What part of my community? What part of work do I value? What part, what are the things personally that I value? So maybe breaking this out into your personal values, your family values, your work values, your community values, and then start setting goals to those values. So if I care a lot about my students at the University of Michigan where I teach, I can set a goal around that. I'm going to teach every one of those students as if they're my own daughter. And that turns into a purpose. So that's a good first step. Another step to think about is who are, who do the, who are the people that you admire the most? Is it a parent? Is it um, a neighbor? Is it a sports hero? Is it somebody in the past? Who is a person or people who you care about uh, who, who you would like to emulate. Not imitate, by the way, but emulate. Uh, think about that. And once you've done this, again, think about this as a suit of clothes. Try on the suit. See if the suit fits. Wear this for a while. Wear it for a few days. See if you can be aligned with this purpose. And if it is, then wear it. And then think about how I can build more energy and more self-control or willpower every day to be aligned 
with that purpose. And I believe you will find yourself becoming happier. What happens when you have this purpose where you're going to teach every one of your students like they're your own daughter and you kind of fall off the wagon? You have a bad day or some student just rubs you the wrong way and, and you you don't live in alignment with that. Uh, how do you deal with that? What a great question. Yeah, well, I treat those lapses uh, not as relapses, not as falling off the wagon, but more as lapses, and I try to learn from them. What did I do? What happened? Did I sleep well? Was I present that day? Was I active that day physically? Was I creative that day? Did I eat well? I actually think about my own behaviors. Was it a tough day? And, but I think about my behaviors. I think about the environment. What happened? Was it raining? Was it sunny? Was it hot? Was it freezing cold? What was it like? And I start trying to examine my own life to figure out what's giving me more energy and more willpower or less energy and and less willpower. When is it that I just lose it and I can't deal with a student suddenly? What is my problem in this? Because if I can't deal with that, it is my problem. And I have to figure that out. I would say that one of the major themes of my book, Life on Purpose, is that we are who we choose to be. So we should be very careful who we choose to be. If somebody wants to figure out their purpose, should it be a pretty easy task? In other words, if it takes a long time to figure out your purpose, then maybe it's not your purpose. (laughs) Well, I think finding a purpose is a process that may take many, many years. So you may discover an initial purpose and then work on that. You might revise it. It may modify a little bit. Uh, You may have life's event to cause that purpose to change. It's a living document, but it is the most important document of your life. So you do want to pay some attention to it, and you must be willing to alter that document. If it's not working for you, it is your life. You are who you choose to be. So change it. And, uh, and make sure that you are careful who you choose to be. Make sure that this purpose is something that you have carefully put together. So if it does take a long time, that's no problem. This is an important document. If you can come up with a purpose in your life right away and start working on that, wonderful. Well, thanks. We're out of time. We ran a little long, but this is really, really an interesting conversation. Thanks, Victor. <laughs> well, thank you. Boy, you asked some great questions. Well, thanks, and I appreciate you being here. Victor Strecker is the author of the book Life on Purpose, and there's a link to the book on the show notes page for this episode of the podcast on our website, somethingyoushouldknow.net. And uh, his book is also available as an audiobook at audible.com. You can just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. And finally today on the podcast, there's a word you probably use a lot that could be driving a wedge between you and your friends, and the word is busy, as in, I've been really busy. Of course, there's nothing wrong with being busy. It's not being busy that drives people away. It's the word busy all by itself. And here's why. Everyone is busy. So when you say you're busy, you're basically saying you're alive. It's just a vague filler word that doesn't really mean much. And it's open to negative interpretation. While many people will accept being busy as enough of an excuse for not hanging out with them the first couple of times, eventually your friends see it as a veil over some other sinister reason for not wanting to hang out with them. Maybe you don't like them anymore and you're just afraid to say it, so you just say, well, I've been really busy. Also, it misses the point. Oftentimes, being busy simply means you have bigger priorities, higher priorities than seeing your friends, which is fine. You may be caring for a child or launching a new project, and there's lots of legitimate reasons why friendships fall down the list of priorities, but simply saying you're busy doesn't really communicate any of that. So instead, replace the word busy with something specific. And sure, it takes more effort to do that, but it's worth doing because the difference in how the message is received is quite significant. And that is something you should know. The podcast today has been sponsored by Audible.com. For your free audiobook download of any one of their thousands and thousands of titles, just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K 
and you will get a free audio book and a free 30-day trial to their service. That's audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. I'm Mike Carruthers. Thanks for listening today to Something You Should Know.